Countdown You. My name's Ryan Sullivan. His name's Andrew Wadden. Andrew, we had a hell, brimstone, and fire of a week in the CIS. We had undefeated matchups in the RSEQ and the OUA. So, Mr. Sullivan, I pose this question to you. Where would you like to start? Uh, OUA. Do it. And that's where we will start. McMaster Marauders, Western Mustangs, the ultimate battle for Ontario supremacy went down this past weekend. As we learned last week, one quarterback is powered by pizza, the other a weird milkshake thing. Would it be the carbohydrate king in Will Finch or the calcium catalyst in Marshall Ferguson? Let's find out together. Welcome to the jungle, London, Ontario. Start things out, 5-2 Mac. Will Finch from seven yards out, scampers at home. It's 9-5 Ponies. Air Marshal Ferguson came to play though. After taking a lick early, he airs this one out to Max Cameron for a nice gain. Ferguson would then finish the drive with a 10 yard toss to Danny Van der Voort. Ferguson not done there. He breaks out the Statue of Liberty to Declan Cross on third and short. Breaks out a nice run, keeps the series alive. Big Daryl Wad then destroys the QB in the backfield. It's called incomplete. He's all right, he breaks out some push-ups. However, the accuracy fails him on this one. Josh Woodman comes down with the pick. Mac not happy as Nick Shortle takes out his frustration, exploding Finch in the backfield. Western was wounded, but would march the ball. Finch hit Shaquille Johnson, he'd do the rest. A nice somersault into the end zone. It's 29-25 Western. Mack would bring it back, and Max Cameron pulls down this touchdown grab with under a minute on the clock. Last chance for the Ponies. Finch runs it, and he gets dropped. Ball squirts loose. That is your game. Mack upsets Western, 32-29. Western loses at home for the first time since September 29, 2012. That was also at the hands of the Marauders, interesting enough. Tyler Carpina set a OUA record in this one, hitting his 78th career field goal, breaking the mark of 77, previously held by Western kicker Liram Hadrulahu. Things don't get any easier for Western this weekend. They host the leading rusher in the CIS, Dylan Campbell, and the Laurier Golden Hawks. G Hawks at home hosting the Lions. There's a good look at OUA rushing leader Dylan Campbell who needs 150 yards to reach 1,000. Better make that 90 yards now. Practice will hand off to Campbell. Sweeps to the right side, big hole opening up for him. He's at the 40, he's into the secondary. And I think Dylan Campbell is gone. Indeed he is, touchdown. DC goes the full 60 for the major. A prerequisite jump bump and the home side gets an early lead. To the fourth we go, and the DC gets fired up once again. Campbell goes 17 yards to the house. Dylan Campbell's two touchdowns have him up to 10, which leads the entire CIS. His 171 yards on the ground put him over the 1,000 mark with just three games to go this year. That, my friends, is beast mode. Out to the nation's capital we go. Waterloo visiting the GGs. Corbin Maxwell tips this Jamie Cook pass right to himself. The alley and the oop, he's gone untouched. GG's destroy the very worried Warriors 51 to 10. Ottawa led 45 blank at the half. This one was never in question. Waterloo's defense is dead last in the CIS this season by a landslide. They've given up 326 points. Varsity Blues on the road to face the Ravens. Start things off early in the first. Nick Gorgachuk tosses this short screen pass to Adam Zucino. He takes it across the field and he gone. Zucino goes 43 yards before being taken down. That led to a Ravens touchdown. Carlton's D would then ramp things up. Huge tackle here. And then they would pounce on this Simon Nasser fumble. But Nasser wouldn't be held down too long. Down 23 Cobb. He goes to the air for Levi Noel, who gets taken down at the one yard line. The Blues would punch that in, cutting the Ravens lead to 16. Right before the beer break, the Ravens, well, with a little trickery. Oh, a trick trick play. Play. oh, he's wide open. Nate Bahar catches the Kyle Van Weisberg pass. What a play. Trickery from Carlton all the way for a touchdown. Ravens win its third game of the year, outsmarting the Blues. This game was the 1,000th game in Varsity Blues history. Blues pivot Simon Nasser also set a new CIS record, completing 49 passes in the loss. The previous record was held by former View of TQB Dan Faraday, who completed 41 passes back on October 17, 1981. 
All right, let's take a look at Guelph and Windsor. Not an amazing day at the office for any one individual from the Guelph Griffins. 24 to nine though, they do pull out the win. They need to stay hot as they head to Carlton to take on a good looking Ravens team while Windsor heads to Ottawa to take on the GGs. Take a look now at the big board in the OUA Mac, the lone unbeaten squad now at six and O. Oh. There's a real battle starting to shape up for the second spot in the conference and for that final playoff spot between Ottawa City rivals, the GGs and the Ravens. The upstart Ravens do have a game in hand, but it won't come easy for the young birds who face Guelph on the road next and have home games versus Windsor and Queens following that. With just one win this season, there has been very little chop in the Acadia Axemen's game this year. Did you say chop? Yeah, because they're like with an ax, like not cur Anyway, never mind. It was homecoming versus St. FX. Roll the highlights, Ryan, jeez. So let's see if those Axemen can chop down X during homecoming. They'll have to bring a big ax to take that flag down. Atta boy, you plant it right in there. We begin late in the first half, X down six. That was until Ashton Dixon runs this one in. St. FX with the lead, and they build on it. A safety and a field goal would grow that lead to five, and then Paulo Edwards puts this one away for the home side. Reads the QB like a book, takes it all the way to the blue paradise. X do it for the 5,100 in attendance, beating the Axemen by 17. St. FX secondary was doing work on the day, picking Acadia four times. Of course, taking one back for a pick six. These two teams will face off once again over the Thanksgiving weekend, this time in Acadia. Absolute annihilation in Halifax, 38-0 Mount Allison over St. Mary's. Let's look at the stats. Uh, let's not, actually. Drew Jacobson, are there, are there more stats? Did we mess up? Are there more available? No? 21 yards? That's it? The stump fest might continue next week as they complete the home and home. SMU heads to Mount Allison. AUS standings board time. Mount A has punched its ticket to the postseason, remaining unbeaten at a perfect five and O. Oh. Well, the X Men, well, they can earn a playoff berth with a win this week at Acadia. How exciting is Blackout Night? Well, it's one of those you've got to be there to believe it. Kind of things. Well, this isn't exactly really exciting for you, the viewer, I'm sure. I feel like you'd enjoy the highlights a little more than this blackout in Saskatoon. Let's go there now. Both teams in need of a win heading into this one. Sean Olsen wishing the refs a good game early. He wouldn't be so kind and calm with the Zebras all night, though. UBC early on called for roughing the center on the Saskia field goal. Move that ball, that's a first down. Drew Burko then hands off to Shane Buchanan. No problem from six yards out. Seven, nothing Huskies, they strike first. UBC comes right back. Marcus Davis with a huge gain on an amazing catch. He then takes the end around in for the major. It's sevens across the board. Saskia would add another major and then off a brutal snap, a brutal punt ensues, giving the Huskies fantastic field goal position. Denton Kolodzinski makes no mistake. He'd add another before the half runs out. Blackout night is always a special night in Saskatoon. The skies light up, it's beautiful. However, that means that the field fogs up. Due to the post-pyro smoke, this game had a 40-minute delay. When we finally resumed, the smoke may have had a bit of an effect. Carson Williams' pass is picked by Andrew Abs. Look at those abs! A nice pick. Moments later, Jordan Bosa steals the show. He steals Drew Burko's toss. Perhaps another look is in store. That is a play of the year by Jordan Boza. Fantastic concentration for the fourth year man out of STM. Some gorgeous thievery by Bosa. It wouldn't result in much though. Let's head to the end of the quarter and Drew Burko finds Bryden Osmond from seven yards out. Sasky goes up 26-10 heading into the final queue. Then on blackout night, the standout Rook takes a page out of a Black Keys album and runs right back. And here is Marcus Davis. Finds some room, stays on his feet, and there he goes! Marcus Davis across the 50, the 45, turn it on the Jets! 20, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, touchdown! Rookie dominating the house, Marcus Davis! 
It's actually a fantastic song. Then, UBC may get robbed of a few here. Quinn Van Gilswick looks to split the pipes. They call it wide. We take another look. I don't know about that call. UBC down, but not done. Williams hits Patrick Bull for a pickup of 20. Brandon Day's jump then charges up the can. That's 15 of his 129 on the ground in this one. Nico Jacobs caps off the drive with a nice grab in traffic at the back of the end zone. T-Birds trail by just six. Under a minute to go and Shane Buchanan then loses the handle. The butter fingers from the player leads to the butter call from the official. It goes uh, UBC and then Sasky. What is going on? The original call was UBC football. Now they give it the ball back to Saskatchewan. You guys, this is an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment, guys. Jim Mullen in the booth, Sean Olson on the field. A surreal finish at Griffiths. 31-25, the final for the Dogs. Shane Buchanan hit the century mark for the first time this season. He was fantastic. UBC will keep the bitter taste in their mouths for at least another week as we head into the Canada West Buys. They'll host Regina next, while Saskatchewan will head to Manitoba. Regina on the road in Calgary. Pick this up with the Dinos already up seven. Andrew Buckley on play action, right to Brett Blasco. 14-0 for the CGY. The Rams would respond. Noah picked in to Jared Janata. That's six for the visitors. But the Dinos, they would bite back. Buckley again on play action. This time he keeps it himself. That's the ginger second major of the day, and I can call him that. I too am a member of the Ginger Nation. Despite losing the services of the reigning conference MVP, Mercer Timmis just minutes into the game, Calgary still managed to rush for 392 yards on the day. Beautiful foot field and beautiful Edmonton, Alberta. Trailing 3-0 early, LeVon Horolak gets Edmonton on the board with his 10-yard trot. It's 7-3 GBs. Curtis Dell then finds Tyler Henry from 15 out. It's 14-3 Alberta at the end of one cue. Dell finds the wrong jersey in the second, overshoots his target, and DJ Lalama says thank you very much. Into the mustard jar he goes. Lead cut to four. Ed licensed to Il Ilnick. He stretches the lead with one of his three majors on the day. Alberta stuns Manitoba. Stuns, stuns Manitoba. 38-31. The GBs improved to 2-1 at home, entering the Canada West by. They only have one more home contest. It comes Saturday, October 18th, their next game, when they host the Calgary Dinos. So this is how things are shaping up around the C-Dub standings. Calgary and Saski sit atop the leaderboard at 4-1. But with just three games remaining, just who will be left out of the playoff pitcher come year's end? Because at the moment, everybody is still in play. Measuring sticks are essential in sports. This past weekend, the undefeated Concordia Stingers, well, they went into peps to see if they could measure up with the mighty Rouge Or. The battle of the RSEQ unbeatens went down in Laval. First Q, the Red Machine gets the ground game going. Maxime Boutin takes this one 13 yards. A few plays later, Hugo Richard caps off the drive. And just like that, it's 7-0 Laval. But the Stingers would get to the rookie pivot. Michael Asare with the thievery, but Concordia does nothing with the pick as the Laval D smothers Stingers pivot Frank Dessereau, not once, but twice, forcing them to punt it away. Concordia's D had some sting of its own though. Textbook tackle right there, complete with a full front flip. Outstanding. And speaking of outstanding, Richard to Felix Faubert, Lucier, that's a pickup of 26 and he rubs it into Asare's face. A couple of plays later, Richard calls his own number and takes it in for the major. Rouge Aor take a 16-0 lead into the Tortier break. Third cue, and this one gets put on ice. Richard to Lucier once again. Très bien catch right there. Laval makes it 23 in a row, giving the Stingers its first loss of the year. Lucier was the high man in the air while Boutin was doing it on the ground. Laval earns a playoff spot, Cal Sabrice. Sherbrooke visiting Montreal, it was a soggy affair, but Mikhail Davidson didn't have any trouble holding on to the ball early. He goes 105 yards all the way to the house. The Blue Man Group, they lead early, it's seven bagel. Jeremy Rock then responds with a two yard toss to Anthony Gosselin, including an earlier safety, it's 9-7, there a or. Gabriel Cousineau goes deep once again in the second, and this time he finds Regis Sibasu. 48 yards later, and it's 17-9 for the Caravan. Nice job shedding those tackles. 
Alexander Obey then looks like a young Toby Gerrard here as he splits the line and he takes it all the way home for Sherbrooke. However, Montreal would add a few more. They take it in front of their home crowd, 22-16, despite that fine effort from Obey. The Caravan will head to Concordia next while Sherbrooke gets the week off before regrouping and retooling and heading to McGill for a date with the Redmen. Grand Tableau time now. As mentioned, the Red Machine have secured a playoff spot. Massive game going down over the Thanksgiving weekend between the Stingers and Carabans, which could very well determine just who will get that second playoff spot in the conference. Oh, some beauty games throughout the league, but now it's time to step back a little bit and give thanks. Thanksgiving weekend coming up. And I gotta say, I'm, I'm thankful for you, Andrew Wadden. Um, I'm thankful for the Vanier Cup and Jim Mullen bringing us Vanier Cups of the past. Can we just you're get not, get out of this and get not, to those right now? Because you're not thankful. This is me. getting creepy for me. You're watching Crown Countdown. You, I gotta get out of here. Here's where you can catch all the CIS action on your TV this weekend. The 2012 Vanier Cup, it was a rematch of the best game ever from 2011. Over 3 million Canadians tuned in at some point to see the quest for revenge from the Laval Rouge Or against the defending champion McMaster Marauders. 2012's Vanier was a rematch between McMaster and Laval. Glenn Constantine and Stefan Patazic, no love lost. McMaster led by Kyle Quinlan, but off the bat, Laval makes a play. Thomas Gerard with the strong interception in the first. In the second, Laval strikes first. Tristan Gerrard's pass to Matthew Norzel, quick hitter. Norzel straight to the end zone. Quinlan would not be denied. Deep strike over the middle brought down by Dolan Brooks. 59 yards later, and McMaster's up by two going into halftime. In the third, Maxime Boutin goes for a run to put Laval up by five. His first touchdown, just a warm-up for this. Boutin hitting the corner, galloping out, deking, leaving the whole McMaster defense in his wake. That's all she wrote. Laval avenges their loss from last year, 37-14. to Boutin wins the Ted Morris as the MVP. This Vanier Cup also set the all-time record for attendance with a crowd of 37,098. Hey, welcome back to Crown Countdown U. It's time once again for the round table portion. Let me introduce the panel to you. On the far side of the table, rocking the purple, Nick Van Exel is joining us. Uh, oh, it's Jim Mullen. Sorry. Right. Don't usually see you in the purple. In the middle, we've got Gord Randall, former Queen's Gale and UBC Thunderbird. And live from Santiago, Chile, we have Andrew Wadden. Thank you for taking time on your vacation to join us. Hey, no problem, Ryan. You know I'd do anything for you, buddy. <laughs> Coming in crystal clear. That's a heck of a feed. Blackout night and the officiating not leaving a good mark on the game. There's a few questionable calls. Well, I think it's something that we've become accustomed to in Canada West over the last 30 years, and nothing's changed in terms of uh, uh, a regional disparity in officials. What we came across in Saskatoon was a crew that called UBC on the first six penalties uh, of the game, and then there were a number of calls that just went completely. Uh, offside. I, I think the source of this, because you don't get this in the OUA and you don't get this in the AUS and you don't get it in the RSEQ, is that you've got geography working against you. You've got one crew of officials in Saskatoon, another separate set of guys in Calgary, another separate set of guys in Winnipeg, another separate set of guys in Vancouver. And they all kind of develop their own cultures, shall we say, and there is a familiarity with the home team because they're there for that home team week after week. So the things that a visiting team does can really stand out to them, and that's something that they're going to throw a flag on. I've seen this before in other sports, in lacrosse, when they have national championships, be it the Man Cup or the Minto Cup. You have uh, uh, officials from Ontario, officials from BC, they call the game very differently. We used to see this in the Memorial Cup before they integrated uh, officials at the Memorial Cup, where if you drew an all Western Hockey League crew, it'd be a lot different from what you've seen in the OHL. Uh, you know, if you don't like what you see in terms of the officials, why don't you become one yourself? You can go to beareref.ca and get off the couch and contribute to the solution instead of 
seeing this problem reoccur time and time again. And it must be frustrating for you as a player when you see this. It's very frustrating. And uh, there's this kind of prevailing mentality uh, from us out here in BC that when we go out to the prairies, it's probably going to go against us. And it gets talked about at least once in the practice week preparing for these trips out to the prairies that, hey, call, early calls go against us you have to be able to brush it off because it's inevitable that it's going to happen. And I mean, we had a game that was protested a couple years ago in Winnipeg where Brian Doby, the Manitoba head coach, actually came up to us in the handshake line at the end and said, that was a travesty. I'm sorry. Like, if you want to protest that, we'll back you up. And I mean, protests never go anywhere. But this is the second game, and you're being very diplomatic when you say that there are regional differences. This game was an absolute job. And I'm not going to say that there was anything sinister going on or it was supposed to be fixed or something like that, but this game was an absolute job. But I don't think that this is a CIS-only problem. I think that this is a Canada problem. We've seen time and time again in the CFL this year that the officiating has just not been the, up to the quality that we expect from officials. And look, I get that it's a difficult job, but there has to be more resources being put into training these guys for the situations that they're going to work. And in the CIS in particular, you need to put money into hiring traveling officials to go back and forth and do these games so you at least have some sort of consistency across the board. The CFL used to do that. They don't do it anymore. They used to add that extra official on it the crew and it doesn't happen anymore and yeah there needs to be more leadership from the top on this all right we got the view from the press box we got the view from the field what's the view like from your side of the uh from the world uh andrew watt and your thoughts on the officiating you've been to a number of canada west games this year uh, a number of cis games of the past few years your thoughts i mean in that game in particular i mean ubc basically you know lost their shot to win the game at the end of the game there i mean when that uh, fumble that ubc you know, blatantly recovered, got called, well, UBC's way, and then, wait, oh, wait a second, no, no, we're going to go over to Saskatchewan instead. I mean, you know, UBC had a chance. They would have been on the 33 of Saskatchewan with, you know, 30 seconds to go. Easily could have gotten seven and won that game. And, I mean, you know, Sean Olson's definitely going to be upset about that. I mean, if you look at Sean right now, his job's kind of maybe on the line at UBC. I mean, he's not doing well this year. Uh, the team had high expectations. I mean, he's got a right to be PO'd. And, you know, I mean, with the refereeing being the way it is, I mean, I'm not going to say that that was what caused the entire game to go towards the Huskies. But in that situation, with that fumble call, I mean, it's that's you just, you just can't have that. We all agree that the officiating went up in smoke. Let's talk about uh, some more fumes that uh, kind of took over. Uh, Griffith Stadium. The halftime show at Blackout Night, it's always a great time. They go way overboard with the fireworks and it's a great show for the fans. Uh, however, the fans got to enjoy it for an extra 40 minutes. Uh, let's start with Gord. Uh, as a player, what does this do to you? Like coming out, getting all jacked up for the second half and you got to sit, you got to wait. Well, for me personally as a player, I hated halftime breaks, period. I just wanted to keep going. Uh, so the longer you sit there, the longer you have to sit and think about things. Coaches probably love it because they get to adjust and all that kind of stuff, but it, it's tough. It takes you out of your rhythm. Uh, I found that coming out in the second half and being ready for that first series was always pretty tough to begin with. Um, how ironic that it's the one night in Saskatoon where it's not a blustery evening <laughs> when they decide to do the fireworks show. I mean, it's hard to say, well, they could have prepared for this because, I mean, it's all, it seems like it's always at least a 20-click win going through there. But uh, it, it's tough, but it also affects both sides equally, and I don't know that it holds any advantage for any one team or another, so I don't really think it's that big of an issue. Yeah, I don't think it's that big of an issue either, and quite frankly, uh, I received a number of phone calls the uh, day after on this from people from across the uh, Canada West with great sanctimony and fury and anger at the uh, Saskatchewan Huskies for uh, holding up the game, and I was wondering where all of this anger and sanctimony was uh, the previous week when there was a player ruled ineligible and the standings were turned upside down. So, you know, I think sometimes sanctimony is a great cover for envy in some cases. And, and when you blow off $50,000 worth of fireworks at a stadium and you continue to draw good crowds uh, at your stadium as a result of putting on a, uh, an event, well, maybe that is the situation that you want to absorb as one of these teams. Because so, so, if you don't have fans, you don't matter. That's the thing at the end of the day. Doing those things bring fans 
and the community out to the park. Yeah, and there's, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of professional teams that don't realize that, like you say, this is an event and presentation plays a huge role in that and keeping the fans happy and keep people, people, keeping people coming back to the stadium. Um, so it's good to see that in Saskatchewan. Unfortunately, it was a 40 minute delay. Andrew, your thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to just pick up what Jim said, really. I mean, uh, I think it's great what the University of Saskatchewan's doing, and I, I think more schools should do it. I mean, in that situation, all right, sorry. Like, you know, stuff happens. But, you know, they got 5,000 fans coming out to those games. They're putting in the effort to make their in-game experience uh, that much better than everybody's really in the Canada West. I mean, schools like Calgary could really take a you know, look at what Saskatchewan's doing, maybe try to get something out of, or some ideas out of them. I mean, UBC, you go up to one of their games. I mean, you know, the in-game isn't really all that exciting. So, you know, yes, stuff happens, but I mean, kudos to the University of Saskatchewan for doing what they're doing because they're driving people out there. I mean, when we go to those games and we're out in Saskatoon, they've got banners on the highway and stuff, uh, or billboards, excuse me, on the highways. We can see the, the Husky games I mean more schools should be doing that sort of thing to promote the product yeah the schools in the Canada West in general need to keep up with the rest of the country in these things going having gone through the OUA myself some of the smaller towns they have great game day presentations there because they have to and it feels like a college football game one more thing I want to touch on, on the break you go to the Vanier Cup it's gonna be a 45 minute halftime break you play in the Super Bowl it's gonna be the better part of an hour I mean, this, this complaining and hand wringing about a lengthy halftime break is just, it's completely absurd. It, it does not affect the quality of the game. And frankly, if these teams think they have championship aspirations, then maybe you need to get used to it. Yeah, well said. Jim, over to you. Uh, quick hits. Uh, I think what we've seen in the OUA is teams holding back on their playbooks. Uh, case in point, McMaster and Western uh, this past weekend. McMaster finally rolled out their playbook, one in Western. And I think uh, really what this underlines is that the competition with the haves and have-nots in the OUA really only shows us half a game. It's time to come up with balanced schedules and maybe even an interlock on top of that. Gordon. Jim, you're absolutely right. There was a big argument for tiering this weekend. Western coming off a drubbing of Waterloo where they barely had to get off the bus um, came out flat against McMaster team. And just in a, in a three-point game, I think it ended up being, that little edge may have cost them the game. Uh, not to give them excuses, because I don't like to give Western any kind of excuses, but that, that's something that really needs to be addressed. I wanted to give a shout out to the Concordia Stingers. I like to be a little more positive this week than I was last week. Uh, one of the most positive losses you're ever going to take is going into Pep Stadium in Quebec and putting up as much of a fight as they did. This team, I think, is for real. We were pretty skeptical coming off, I think, a winless season or a one-win right. season. We were pretty skeptical. This team's for real. They slugged it out with Laval, and I'm looking forward to seeing them once they get to playoff time. And I think they have Montreal in a couple weeks, which will be another good litmus test for them. Andrew Wadden, take us home. I want to uh, give the tip of the cap to Simon Nasser, quarterback at the University of Toronto. He broke former University of Toronto quarterback Dan Faraday's completion record, smashed it really. Uh, it was 49 of 62, uh, 548 yards, three touchdowns. However, the Varsity Blues lost to the Ravens, but uh, Simon Nasser. Fantastic game, probably one of the best you're going to see all season long from a quarterback, and unfortunately, though, he had to take the loss. For Andrew Wadden coming to us live from the other side of the world, Jim Mullen all the way on the other side of the desk, Gord Randall in the middle, I'm Ryan Sullivan. Thanks so much again for joining us, and here's your CIS Top 10. Number 10. Number 9. Number 8. Number 7. Number 6. Number five. Number four. Number three. Number two. And number one. Thanks for watching Crown Countdown U. Now, let's get out to the game.